What has she seen? She has seen two, from the size of the world as we know it now, relatively minor European countries go to war against each other in the beginning of the 20th century and call it a world war. And she has seen soldiers in those peculiar, strange, flat hats come back and some not come back. And she has seen a new power rise in Germany after that. And then another war called the Second World War, which had some Pacific engagements, but was really another regional conflict. And then a time of prosperity. And then the coming of television. And then telephones everywhere. And billboards. And then billboards that move. And sometime around the 1960s, a little pill, which, if women take it regularly, will keep them from conceiving offspring. And that changed everything. And then a sexual revolution. And then a war in Vietnam. Oh, Lord, what has this woman seen? And then radios that you could hold in your hand which became telephones small enough to fit in your car. And then those telephones became small enough to fit in your hand. What has this woman lived through? What did hospitals look like in the first years of her life compared to the beauty of Providence Center with its wide, hallways and its caring staff. <clears throat> How has society changed from a time in her experience when everybody around her had, within a couple of degrees, sort of the same kind of skin color that I do, to a society which is now much more diverse, much more interesting, infinitely more conflict-ridden, but I think much better for all of that. In 100 years of living, can you have had enough? Will you reach a point where you feel like the hymn writer did, whose hymn we just sang, Change and Decay. In all around I see, O oh, thou who changest not, abide with me. Do you hope for some permanency, for some stability, for a place that doesn't change while all around you seems to be spiraling out of control, circling the bowl, as one of my ruder friends likes to say? Well, maybe you do. But I would suggest that there is a better way to age. And that is to stay open. To continue to embrace new things that prove themselves to be good. To continue to try new experiences. To listen to that music that sounds like noise until it becomes something more. And I know the, the music that, that you guys listen to sounds like noise to your parents. You can stay 
in the present and age. And I suggest to you this afternoon that as much as it must be a challenge to live to the age of 100, for all the things that you have had to grieve and say goodbye to. And I could be wrong, but I don't think any of her peers are with us this afternoon. It's more true to say that 100 years is 100 years of new gifts from a beautiful world God created, which is ever-changing so that we may glory. Let us praise God. Daddy, will you be speaking to these folks? Would you do that? Last, last week, Saturday morning, we had the formation, and uh, whilst I was having a sleepless night, I called up my system in the UK and compared notes for an hour to the phone. And uh, Granny had a heart. She was born 8th of August, 1903. In salt ash brown New England. Her father had a grocery shop, and one of her happy memories was she and her sister, Auntie Wynn, would take the pony trap down to the market uh, to get supplies for the grocery, grocery shop. And one day they were coming back, and they saw this doctor with this newfangled machine called the automobile on the side of the road broken down. You couldn't go anywhere because here they were with their phone trap. They laughed at them and went on. Her husband, William Dixon, was a postmaster. He died very early in life at the age of 36. Uh, during the Second World War. He didn't die in the war, he, he died of an uh, intestine disease. And having lost her husband uh, at such a young age, Granny was in despair. However, for a night when she was asleep, she woke up, and this is a story she told my sister. She woke up to see her husband's ghost standing at the foot of her bed telling her everything would be okay to carry on. She was close to her sister, Auntie Wynn. Well, my, my mother's Aunt Wynn, but they all called her Auntie Wynn, like everybody called her Auntie Wynn. Um, and they lived in Bristol, and they lived in two apartments. Uh, one of, one of uh, Auntie Wynn lived with her ran down below until Auntie Wynn had to go into uh, a home uh, in Northern Atlanta into in Bristol. Granny was estranged from, Granny never talked much about her brother. I didn't even know she had a brother. Uh, she was estranged from her brother early on in life. Uh, her brother also died a little bit. Her only daughter took ill and was not able to be look after her or be much comfort to her in her old age. And in 1997, she had to go to the Providence Center, where in, I guess, 99, 2000, 
she started to lose her memory. In 2001, 2002, she more or less lost all her memory, and then she was dead. She had no memory of who she was, she had no memory of her independence, where she was at. The two people she all, nearly always remember, right until I think a couple of weeks before she passed away, were our share. That's how much she meant to Every weekend, or every second weekend, they would accompany Kylie to go see her. To live such a life takes a moment of its her. And I'll now go on to some of the happy memories. I have an email here from my cousin in Delhi. Dear Karin, Sanjeev, Akshay, Amar, and Rahul, we came to know yesterday about Granny's passing away. It's uh, the last of our grandparents' generation. She really was a great lady. I remember when she first came to India, she looked like the Queen Mother, had purse and all, and we were so anxious to please. And your mom was so amused at all the fuss people made of her. She was so appreciative of everything. Karin and Rahul, you did not know any grandfathers, but your grandmoms were very nice and gentle people, and they did look queen together. Then at Bombay, I was amazed at the interest she took in everything around her. She knew more about Indian politics than everyone else. That's what Granny was. She always took an interest, and as far as I am to say, was open. Always trying to learn more. I'm sure you all must be feeling a sense of satisfaction of having had a good 100th birthday get together for granted. You don't get such opportunities every day. This picture of Granny was taken at her 100th birthday, the Robin Center, with all the flowers that had come from the immediate family and relatives from the UK. <clears throat> Karin, of course, was closest to Granny and, and was the one who gave her all that caring. Those Sundays will seem sadly empty now, even though you had to push everything else aside to visit her. I'm happy to have known her briefly, and she was part of my childhood too, and shared her loss. Now then, Granny made the best of her life. She enjoyed herself as much as she could. She enjoyed the occasional well, okay, nightly gym or sherry, whatever I guess towards the end Sanjeev would offer. Uh, did the crosswords, late to her late uh, 90s, uh, or early 90s. Um, she had no problem telling people off, as I'm sure Sanjeev can attest to. <laughs> I don't even be in <laughs> um, She was generous with her resources. She wouldn't spoil it. She wouldn't necessarily spoil us. That's open to debate. And some people think I was for it. But she was always there when her resources were needed. And we called her the bank of money. She, when she lived with Karin and Sanjeev, uh, as much as she could, she helped a couple of kids when they came home, had milk ready for them. Uh, Able to. She'd wash the dishes, uh, to very often wash the breakfast dishes left behind after everybody went to the bed. In her early life, she went to a country fair. And at the country fair, I think uh, she had she went to a gypsy and had a tea in Israel. The gypsy told her that you will travel the world. I'm not surprised when Granny laughed at her. Well, she did travel. She moved to India to live with us in 82. 
and then subsequently move to live with Carlos and the Russian in 1990. I came over with her, and here I was, this not so white looking gentleman pushing a little old white lady in a wheelchair into immigration. So the immigration people looked at her, looking at the society, to see who to be was. They wanted to know what our relationship was, etc. Then they asked us, well, okay, when did your granddaughter or your sister come to Canada? So Granny and I looked at each other, we started talking amongst ourselves. We were like, well, Akshay was born so and so. Uh, Amar, no, Amar was born so and so. Akshay was born so and so. Amar is so, so old, so they must have come to Canada so many years ago. They're like, okay, hang on. We go outside, they call for Karim. Karim comes over, they say, How long ago did you guys move to Canada? Karim looks at Sanji, and they did something similar. How old is Amar? And they just looked up and said, Okay, oh, it'll be through in a few minutes. <laughs> so, they must have figured out, uh, here's this guy, East Indian, you've seen these tricks all before, you know? Trying to push a little old white lady through and thinking, he had some new treatment for us. When she was applying for her immigration, I think she had to have a medical checkup done. <coughs> so, I think Dr. Yao helped filling up some of the forms. And he goes, okay, Granny, they want you to come backwards from 100. So she was in her 90s. Uh, about that, yeah. And uh, she, she starts off 199. Well, I can't come back. Is that fast? And she was busy waking up. Doctor Yao looks at her, laughs, looks at the sheaf of forms, and goes, "Okay, you can go home. I'll fill up these forms and I'll keep present." <laughs> so in her 90s, she was so aware of it. She enjoyed watching TV. Uh, Programs like All in the Family with Archie Bunker in it. And while she may have found Akshay and Amar's music to be noisy, she enjoyed their TV shows. One, one evening, we were sitting there. She's flipping the remote. We're like, Granny, what are you looking for? She looks at us and goes, Can't find the Simpsons. <laughs> And here we are, she used to be like, oh, I gotta watch Simpsons because Akshay and Akshan Amar are watching it. Oh, the secret is out. She ain't got the Simpsons as much as anybody else. She smoked. I mean, she defied a lot of current wisdom. She smoked till she was in her 80s. Puffed two or three cigarettes a day. The only reason she gave up because she'd fall asleep with a cigarette in her mouth. She enjoyed chocolate cream and strawberries, marmalade, morning tea and afternoon tea. Well, these were some of my memories and some of my family memories of them. We're very, very, very lucky to anyone else had any memories I'd like to share. Well, when Granny passed away, I was uh, unable to go see her. In, in some ways, uh, I think it was, it was meant to be. I remember Granny with a smile to date. Some of the things that I said to her and when she laughed, one of the most uh, common discussions we had, every time she told me that she was getting old, I said, let's go for a jog, Granny, and she would say, why don't you go, I'll catch up. <laughs> and uh, towards the end, she started saying, why don't you go, and the, the last part fell off. Uh, so. It was, it was, she, she lived with us for about five years before she moved to Providence. And 
she did everything for herself. It was it was unbelievable that a lady at that age took care of everything on her own and uh, never allowed us to feel that there was a stranger in the house or a third person in the house. She was, we didn't even realize that she was there. She did her own thing and she attended all the parties that some of you attended. And when it was time for her to go to bed, she just got up and excused herself and off she went. Um, but always with a smile. So I will always remember her, her smiling and I hope that everybody else also remembers her in the same manner. And I thank you all for coming today um, for this ceremony.